Welcome to a special episode of The Mentorship. We are here with Cebu. I'm so excited to have you here from Jordan. We're going to give a chance for folks to join in today. Thank you for those who are joining us on Instagram Live as well as Facebook Live. We're really excited to have a wonderful guest here today. I decided that I think there is a segment of the population that does not get enough attention. And I want to make sure that we cover that today because I think there are folks from all around the world that say, I want to travel. I have the points. I have the miles. I want to go and explore the world. There's so many countries out there, but I don't have a partner, but I'm by myself. I don't know. Uh, the media says it's dangerous. Um, I find it interesting. Can I go there? So we're going to cover a lot, a lot of those things today. And today, I don't think I have a better guest than with Cebu. She actually has a fantastic um, Instagram account. I would advise everyone to go check it out. Go Global with Cebu. And today, she's joining us from Jordan. And she's actually putting a group, group trip together for a lot of solo uh, female travelers and male travelers you'd like to come join in and meet. Um I think it's a great opportunity. So you get to be able to explore the world and explore countries you never had a chance to explore before, but at the same time, meet other folks who are, have similar interests. And uh, we're so excited. Thank you, Cebu, for joining us today. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me. And hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Cebu. I'm going to let you know a little bit more about myself first. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to say that basically one of the reasons why I first started traveling alone was because I just basically got tired of waiting around for people. You know how they say the group trip never leaves the chat? And that's basically what happens with life. Like you have the money, you have the resources, you have the time. And you know other people do, but they're not as committed to traveling as you are. And so I basically got tired of waiting around for life to happen. And I knew that I needed to make life happen for myself. So um, I started traveling but started traveling and living and traveling around the world when I was 17. Um, and believe me, that was pretty daunting at first. Um, but the more I traveled, the more I realized that the world is a much safer place than we think it is. So I prepared a little presentation for you with a couple of pictures, some background information about myself, and most importantly, um, information about the Balkans and Africa, which I think are two very, very underrated regions in the world that most people don't pay attention to that are easily, easily reachable with points. Uh, and not only that, whether it's airline, uh, flight points or hotel points, you will actually be able to find places in which to stay using your points. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the present button. Good morning. Perfect. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna start. So I'm Cebu. Um, I've been living and traveling around the world since 2005. That basically means that I left home in 2005. I studied abroad, did my undergrad, my master's degree abroad. Um, I've lived in multiple countries. I now speak five languages. I love, I am obs completely obsessed with travel and I share all of the tips hacks and everything that I've learned over the years, over the last basically 20 years on my page, on my social media, Go Global with Cebu. I've been to around 100 countries. Um, I guess I could have been to more, but I love slow travel. Like I'm here in Jordan right now and I'll probably be spending two months here just to give you an idea of like what my travel style is like. By the way, I'm a full-time traveler, full disclosure. I work remotely just in case. Um, I started traveling full-time in, in 2020. Um, and this was all due to the pandemic. So that basically allowed me to leave home and start traveling full time. And I'm obsessed. I've been doing this now for four years now. And so I pick a country, I stay there a few weeks, and then I hop on to the next country. Sometimes I do repeats like now Jordan and other times I'll just hit a new destination. Because of my travel experience and expertise, um, I'm an intern. I now I do a lot of different things. I've got a lot of different side hustles. Uh, and one of them is working as an international travel guide. So basically I'm freelancing for two companies where I work together with local guides to guide people through destinations. And these are more off the beaten path destinations. Like next month, for example, I'm going to Iraq um, to lead a trip there um, together with a local company. And last but not least, I decided after 
so many years of traveling, I felt like there was something missing in the travel industry. And so I went ahead and co-founded my own travel company, which is called the Hybrid Tours. And what we basically do is focus on fun, like actually having fun while traveling, but combining that with education um, and sustainable tourism. So we basically connect you, the traveler, with local communities, um, arrange meetings with them so you can actually get to learn about history from people on the ground and not necessarily just from visiting museums. That's fantastic. Um, so just to give you an idea what kind of traveler I am, I feel like every destination out there has something to offer. And now I know I might be a little bit unconventional. These are some pictures of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. I went to Yemen a few months ago. I've also been in Venezuela, you know, the typical destinations that people tell you to stay away from. And now if you're watching this, I am by no means asking you to go to these destinations, especially if it's completely out of your comfort zone. But this is just to give you an idea of like how different things are on the ground. So whenever I'm traveling, I basically do not listen to what travel advisories have to say. That doesn't mean that there aren't certain countries that I'm currently avoiding uh, because I know it's not a good time to visit. But if I ever want to get proper information on the ground about what's happening, I rely on bloggers, travel bloggers and bloggers and people online. And they're going to be the ones who give me accurate information instead of just the government website that basically says, do not visit for this, this and that reason. That was probably written by someone who has no idea about what's happening on the, in the country. Um, and I wanted to first talk about the three main travel misconceptions that I see everywhere I go. So people say if it's popular, it's safe. I'm sorry, but I felt unsafer in Paris and in London than I have in Afghanistan. And I'm not joking. Um, and whether it's um, mugging or harassment, especially as a woman, like these are different things that I've unfortunately encountered in countries that are more popular and i wanted to give you the perfect example here so i'm actually originally from costa rica and as we all know costa rica has been extremely popular and it's been trending for years now and most people will be more inclined to go to costa rica than they would to el salvador so the picture on the left is in the middle is from el salvador el salvador is actually now the safest country in latin america now they changed their policies recently and everything and i mean everything on the ground has changed if you look at the travel advisory from El Salvador, it has a level of three out of four, meaning avoid, four being the highest level that the U.S. government um, issues. And that is completely different from the reality on the ground. Now, you will probably feel more inclined to go to Costa Rica than you would to El Salvador, when in reality, El Salvador is much safer than Costa Rica is. And this just th these changes just came about in the last two years. But unfortunately, travel advisories do not currently represent most, I would say 80, 90 percent of the time, do not, cur do not are not very accurate when it comes to the situation on the ground. Um, we also tend to think that if it's more off the beaten path, it's got to be really expensive and it's going to be completely underdeveloped. And I, if there's anything I've learned over the years is that there's wealth to be found everywhere, especially, for example, if you're traveling to, I don't know, Africa, by the way, Africa, meaning there's 54 countries and there's so much to offer. We cannot just think of Africa as a whole, as a conglomerate, but um, oh, if you go to Africa, there are only children on the street begging and you're going to have a horrible time. Like there is wealth to be found everywhere in the world. And you'll be very surprised once you start going to more off the beaten path destinations with what you'll be able to find. And in a lot of these places, believe it or not, you will be able to find hotels where you can redeem those points that are just waiting to be spent. And last but not least, like I said before, I should listen to travel advisories. That's one of the biggest travel misconceptions out there. I have a whole article, which I can share with you later, um, that I wrote. I actually have a degree, a master's degree in human rights and international conflict. Um, so I'm pretty well versed with everything that's happening around the world in geopolitics. And I have a whole article that I wrote on why I don't think you should listen to all travel advisories. And here's a fun fact for you. If you Google US worldwide caution, the U.S. issued a travel advisory in May of this year, which basically means worldwide ca caution, which basically means that they're asking you to be cautious in every single country that you go to. It's a worldwide caution. It's not exclusive to one part of the world or the other. That basically means that they want you to be careful and that they suggest 
that they're implying that you shouldn't be traveling abroad to every single country in the world. That is absolutely ridiculous. And that's why I personally do not listen to travel advisors. And I do also have full evidence um, that I show you in this article, for example, that they're very, very politically biased. Yeah, you know, can I ask you about that? That is maybe that's one of the, how do they come up with this? You mentioned about El Salvador saying there's still three out of four from a danger level, but you're saying it's now one of the safest countries in the world. We've been hearing a lot of the changes and I think a lot of us have heard about that. Um, why do they leave it still there at three or four? Is there some reason that maybe we're not aware of? Um, the political relationship that the U.S. has with El Salvador. That's basically it. Um, so, for example, I can give you a really good example. Um, South Africa. It's funny because South Africa is the... So there's Egypt, Morocco, and South Africa. Those are the three most visited countries in the whole of the African continent. 54 countries, right? And South Africa is actually pretty dangerous. Like, this is coming from me. Like, it's actually pretty dangerous. Um, there's a lot of crime going on. However, because it's so popular, we go ahead and we visit it anyway. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but there, you have to be a lot more cautious. While in neighboring countries, it is a lot safer, but they don't get the same reputation. However, South Africa has been known to be friendlier with the U.S., and that's why they get a level of two. And Namibia, right next door, where I happened to travel alone for a whole month, which, by the way, I don't know if I feel comfortable doing that in South Africa. I was taking buses. I was doing it completely on my own. Namibia also has a level of two. Namibia is more left-leaning. Namibia, in my opinion, should have a level one. And according to what the U.S. states, I think South Africa can actually, could actually even go up to a three because of the crime. So, and this is just like one example. Uh, Maldives, the Maldives has a level two or three two, if I'm not mistaken, and that's just because it's a Muslim-majority country and not very friendly with the U.S. The UAE also has a level of two. I think Saudi Arabia has a level of three. Saudi Arabia is extremely safe. Um, I, I was traveling around um, Saudi Arabia also for a month, uh, about two years ago. So these are just a few examples of how different things really are on the ground. They're just intimidating from a Western perspective. But once you're actually there, the reality is very, very different on the ground. See, but before you get into the Balkans, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. I have a friend of mine who's, uh, he's working on the line, that new city they're building out. And is, is that area, you know, and I hear sometimes from folks online, a lot of times saying you shouldn't go there because they don't support women and things like that. How do you feel about some of these countries that are perceived a lot of times as, um, you know, uh, uh, oppressive to, to females. Is it safe for them to travel there? Can we just answer that kind of upfront? Because I think that's important for a lot of people to know. Completely. Um, and this is a question I get asked all the time. Like, why would you travel to these destinations if you're basically supporting the government? Now, like I said, this is my background. Like, I actually studied human rights. And every single country commits human rights violations. And I know that's not something we want to hear, but it's true. If you're watching this, your country commits human rights violations. Finland, Sweden, even the you know most highly coveted countries in the world commit human rights violations. I think it's really, I think the main thing here is to actually like make a clear distinction between the government and the people. Like if I'm going, for example, and I think this is, based, so there's probably, um, Turkmenistan, I would say, and North Korea are two countries where you know for 100% as a fact that your most of your money is going towards supporting the government, but everything else, is the government in place? Yes, it is. But realistically speaking, your money will actually be supporting locals on the ground that work in the tourism industry. If you're going into a shop, you're going to be supporting them with your money. If you buy a rug, a carpet, a tea set, if you go into a restaurant, you're going to be supporting people who actually own the restaurants and not not necessarily the government. It's not their fault that they're governed um, by someone that we don't necessarily agree with. Will a chunk of your money be going towards your government? Yes, it's inevitable. It's 100% inevitable. However, I can assure you that it will be a very, very small chunk. Okay. Thank you. Love to hear about the Balkans. This is a this is an area that we don't usually hear much about. Can you explain maybe about what is the Balkan? How many countries is that? When we can explain that for a second. Yeah, sure. So the Balkans is basically anything, um, the, the bunch of little countries above Greece. So we hear about Greece um, and that's it. So Croatia, for example, is actually part of the Balkans. But I am asking you here to not go to Croatia and instead visit other lesser known 
countries in the Balkans. And so the Balkans, unfortunately, went through a huge war, um, the whole region back in the 90s. And so the funny thing about traveling in the Balkans, and like I said, uh, I, the Balkans I've done on my own, I think I spent, I was traveling overland for about two, three months, um, just taking local trains and buses. And, and like I said, I was doing this solo. And the funny thing about the Balkans is that I even came across Europeans, Western Europeans, who were in shock by how developed everything was. And they were like, oh, we were expect expecting everything to just be a pile of demolished buildings or whatnot. And it, that could not be further from the truth. I think it's like a raw version of Europe. But that doesn't mean that there, one, isn't a lot to see, and two, that there isn't proper tourist infrastructure in place. So a lot of the misconceptions that I hear is that it's war-torn, that there's no infrastructure, that they're very unfriendly people. And here's the funny thing. I'm sure if you're watching this, you must have heard at some point about the people, um, all these locals attacking tourists in Barcelona because they're completely fed up with tourism. Now, the Balkans is a country, is a region that needs tourism and they will i can assure you welcome you with open arms and that's the beauty about going off the beaten path that instead of you contributing towards over tourism and having locals absolutely hate you you're going to regions where you're going to be welcomed with open arms and last but not least difficult to travel in like all the major websites um have connections there you can easily connect for example if you're watching this um turkish airlines you can take local airlines and there's marriott's there's hilton's um, there's Hyatt's, like, it's not underdeveloped as we think it is. Can I ask you, when we think of uh, underdeveloped, is the tourism industry segment set up pretty well? Do you need to kind of pre-set uh, up a, a tour already when you're going there? Or could you make kind of changes along the fly? Because, you know, it, it's how developed is it, I guess, in some of these countries? I think if I, my personal recommendation would be to eat, you can join a tour or you can easily rent a car. Um, the only disadvantage of renting a car is that you're not going to get to engage with locals. You'd be traveling around the area by yourself, but it's completely and 100 percent doable. Like you can use all the major platforms, booking, everything that we're used to, and you can find accommodation on the ground, um, not in like in Croatia, for example, there's Uber like it's it's not that far-fetched and like distant as we think it is it's much much more developed than we think it is like i was in boston they're opening up a taco bell now and i was like jesus christ you know um so it's much more i wouldn't want to say west like like the what the idea of like western world that we have but it's um you'd be surprised once you get there to see how much it has to offer and compared to the western part of europe and this is what i really really want to highlight is that you can basically find everything that Western Europe has without the crowds and the prices. Like the outdoor activities, the food scene. Now the food scene is different. And I know some people might think, oh my God, but it doesn't have Italian or Spanish food. I get that, but it's the food's still delicious. And it's just a different type of food. Cuisine, sites, even vineyards, castles. Like there's so many different things you can do. And you can do it at a fraction of the price without having to put up with the crowds. And for me, that's absolutely priceless so this summer um so i was i spent the whole summer in europe um and i spent a good chunk of it in the balkans why because i didn't want to deal with all the crowds and all the people complaining about me being there so instead i just went to the balkans and i had an amazing time uh where people are welcoming the food scene is amazing and i'm spending again a fraction of what i would normally spend anywhere in western europe See, but when we're looking at all these countries in the Balkans, is there one in one or two in particular that are noteworthy? That are not worthy? Oh no, that are noteworthy that we should. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, was like, no. I mean, I basically, if you ask me, there's like I recommend people visit every country out there. That's my. So uh, I didn't put it on the list. Um, I would. I work. I'm gonna start with the one where I don't think people should go to and not because i'm pushing you to not go there just simply because it's just too much like over tourism has completely run the place to the ground and i'm talking about croatia here so croatia is actually part of the balkans and here's the funny thing like when i first went to croatia i remember people laughing at me this was more than 10 years ago they're like oh my god why are you going to croatia what are you going to do there it's boring there's nothing to do it's going to be horrible and now what everybody and their grandma wants to go to croatia right um, Albania and Montenegro are up and coming 
And you can see that, like you can already see that on social media. So like I said, all of this, all of this region within the next three, five, 10 years, it's all going to be popping. So it's just a matter of time for you to go before the prices go up like crazy. Um, and it's completely overrun like tourists, like everything in Europe is because I, I saw this TikTok and they were comparing Europe to Disneyland. And that's what Europe feels like nowadays, at least the more touristy parts. But personally, um, Albania for the beaches. Oh, my God. Absolutely incredible. But the two places that come to mind, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is my absolute favorite. And if you wanted to join us, we actually run tours there with um, the hybrid tours in North Macedonia. Okay, awesome. I, I wanted to ask you, yeah, I was going to ask about those beaches. Are um, Do you find that the the folks that come there are they usually European as well? Are they from Asia? Are they from South America? Are they, how many how many Westerners like from the U.S. are usually right now visiting uh, this area? So it's funny because if you go, like I was in the picture on the top where I'm with two friends. By the way, people that I met while traveling, I was again going solo. That's in Montenegro and Kotor. I don't know if you've heard of it. I was just so this was from two years ago. This picture and I was just there this summer and. Um, I heard a lot more English this time around than I did the time, the last time I was there. So I feel like the more touristy destinations, you can definitely find Americans there and West, like Western European travelers. If you go to smaller towns, you'll probably only come across most of the time, um, local travelers or travelers from around the region. But that doesn't mean that there aren't English speaking people out there. I do not speak any of the languages that are spoken in any of these countries and I manage just fine with English. Awesome. Another destination, another area that I really wanted to highlight, and I know this is like basically, buck so the reason I'm highlighting the Balkans is if you wanna to go to Europe, if you're thinking about going to Europe, skip Western Europe, go to the Balkans. That's my personal recommendation. But if you're looking for, you know, the trip of a lifetime, because I know this is a bucket list destination for many many people southern east africa so um a lot of the, so just to give you some background i've uh been to this part of the world i think three times um and last summer i actually traveled by land from namibia i went down to south africa and then i went all the way up to tanzania um and it took me about three months to do this and i was doing everything on the ground taking local buses and local trains now i'm not expecting you to do that but it's just to give you an idea of how safe it can be on the ground i would personally just recommend for you to rent a car and because car companies are so used to having people cross borders it is completely normal for you to just go rent a car and you pay a premium to make sure that you can cross borders and visit several countries while you're traveling in the region so some of the typical misconceptions unsafe no english spoken extreme poverty everywhere and only safaris to offer in reality most of this region was colonized by the uk so you'll definitely find english speakers everywhere um the whole extreme poverty thing i'm sorry but you'll you'll find top-notch luxury lodges everywhere uh i use i actually used points last time in south africa zambia and tanzania and i stayed in some really really nice places with was it I, I used Hyatt and Marriott points, if I'm not mistaken, um, because that's what I had at the moment. Um, and some of these pictures are from Lesotho, uh, Namibia, Botswana, Uganda. And so going to this region is basically like, I don't know, the trip of a lifetime. You know, so many adventure opportunities, stunning beaches, which I should have put up a picture of, deserts, vineyards, the food scene is to die for. People are really, really friendly. And like I said, the only place I keep an eye out for my stuff is probably South Africa. Everything else is pretty safe. I included a few countries here. Um, and the two that I didn't include that I've also visited because they're in East Africa are Uganda and Tanzania. And out of all these countries, surprisingly, the one that I was least impressed by was the most popular one, South Africa. Sibu, can we ask, I, I know some folks here, a lot of people have, I know my group, we have people who are planning to go to South Africa. If they're going to go to multiple countries, let's say like Kenya or Tanzania or Uganda, how easy it to, is it to rent a car and drive around? <clears throat> is it safe to do that? It is. It is. And you'll find people like myself doing solo traveler travel that was based i was like in the five percent of the travelers that i came across i would say that basically yeah 
90% of the people, of the travelers that I came across, they had all rented cars or they had booked safaris, um, whether through an international company or through a local company. And they just flew out there to be greeted at the, um, at the airport. So I would basically divide it in two. And that's why I said Southern East Africa. So East Africa, the countries are much bigger. Um, so their idea, you should probably maybe fly in between countries. So Tanzania to Kenya, for example, is quite a bit of a drive. In that case, I would actually just recommend to fly in between. And there's a bunch of local airlines that you can take for a hundred. And these are easily found on, you know, Skyscanner, Google flights, all the major, um, websites that we know about. Uh, so I would divide it into two East Africa. Now, when it comes to Southern Africa, that loop, that's normally what people do. So people will rent a car and they'll do Botswana, Namibia, a bit of Zamb Zambia, Zimbabwe, because of Victoria Falls. They'll go down to um, so Namibia. They'll go down to South Africa. Something that a lot of people skip um, are two tiny, tiny countries, some of the smallest countries in the world, Lesotho and Eswatini, which I adored. And I should have put up a picture of it here. I actually went skiing. They have ski resorts in Lesotho. I mean, what are the chances? You go to Southern Africa and you go skiing. Um, that was priceless, absolutely priceless. Um, and then from there, you just finish the loop and then you fly back. And that's what most people do. Uh, I think she, um, I know one of my, one of our guests here, she asked about Mozambique. Have you visited Mozambique or is there any uh, easy to drive around or, or, or same since your situation or? I did not include Mozambique because I haven't actually been. So I don't, obviously I don't want to give information I that, you know, is not relevant to me. Do I know about Mozambique? I do. The reason I didn't put up Mozambique is because Mozambique right now should be divided into two. The Northern part is a no-go. Even I, considering I've been to all these crazy places, even I wouldn't go to Northern Mo Mozambique right now. Um, the situation is not stable at all. So you should stick to the Southern part. Um, and you can either fly to Maputo from Johannesburg, super easy, or you can also drive um, from South Africa. You can rent a car in Johannesburg and then make the drive to Maputo. Um, and if you do this, I highly recommend you drive through Eswatini, which is one of the countries that I mentioned. By the way, if Eswatini doesn't ring a bell, you might've heard of Switzerland. This is the new name. They changed their name a few, a few years ago. So you can actually drive through Eswatini on your way to Mozambique. All right, wonderful. I, <clears throat> I, I had a friend of mine, actually a teacher of mine who was, a big Angola specialist. And from my, I, the only thing I remember back then now is that they had more landmines than they had people. So sometimes I think about that. I'm like, is it safe to go? You know, things like that. Is, has Angola changed much over the years or it's still kind of a. Angola is a, it's a challenging one. I haven't been yet, but it is a challenging one. I would not ask like uh, for, for this presentation, for example, uh, would I go to Angola? Yes. Would I recommend your viewers to go to Angola? Now that's a whole different story. I mean, like I said, 54 countries, there's tons to see. I personally recommend and any of the ones that I pointed out here are absolutely, absolutely stunning. Um, so there's, I feel like there's a time and place for everything. I was dying to go to Sudan um, and I didn't have the chance. And now Sudan, unfortunately, is going through a conflict. And I know it will get better in a few years. And when it does, I'll go. So I feel like a, some countries, they have like relative, um, you know, periods of stability. Sometimes they don't. So for example, I, I know this might sound funny to some of you, but there are actually a good amount of countries that have travel advisories against the U.S. and they don't recommend people to go to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Same with the U.K. with all the protests and everything going on. So people were actually choosing to go to other places. Again, I'm with the whole travel advisory thing, you know, I, I'm sure you've gathered by now that I, I feel a certain way about them, but I feel like there's a time and place for everything. El Salvador before 2022 would have been absolutely impossible to go to, and now it's extremely safe. So I think it's important to be aware of what's happening on the ground. And like I said, the way I do this is through, um, which I didn't mention before, Facebook groups or basically following people on social media and getting information from people that are actually there on the ground. Siva, can you maybe explain to you your process to help someone think about traveling somewhere or researching somewhere? Where do you go or what kind of safety precautions do you take eventually when you decide to go somewhere for the first time? Um, these are really the the ones that I take are very, very generic. And I think that's due to the fact that I'm very a very seasoned traveler. But, you know, insurance is extremely important. I personally do not go with like, you know, an insurance for every trip. I basically just buy the best travel insurance out there that covers 
risky destinations like the ones that I normally go to. So that's super important for me. Um, having money separate. So I have cash in one place. I have my cards separate in another place. Um, uh, my passwords are saved somewhere else. So those are like little precautions that I take. Um, I do not take my passport on me at any times. That just stays in the hotel or wherever it is I'm staying. And I, But I do keep a copy of my passport. Um, and I also have a digital copy of my passport at all times. Um, just basic precautions. As a solo female traveler, what I will do, and this is extremely important, I only stay in places that have good reviews. This is a must, a must. Like I am not gonna risk uh, my well-being just by staying in a place that doesn't have enough reviews or that have sketchy reviews, but I'm like, oh, I wanna save a little bit of money. So as a solo fee or as a solo traveler, as a traveler in general, like I get um, a lot of information from reviews. So I do read those very thoroughly before making a decision. And then I'll look at blogs, make sure that they were written or updated within the last year. Um, and then go on Instagram or TikTok to get more information on the ground. Um, from there, I'll probably do a little research to see when's the best time to visit. Uh, hopefully not too hot, not too cold, um, not monsoon, rainy season, etc. Book flights, accommodation, and once I have the or flight and then activities on the ground or hire a company to take me around. See, I just had a session yesterday about travel insurance. So you're going to come off right off of a session I had about travel insurance. Uh, we talked about a lot of different types. Do you have one in particular that you use since you're a digital nomad? Do you kind of have like a more of a a specialty type of insurance that you work with? Unfortunately, the ones I have insurance, but I don't think it's very reliable, to be honest. I don't feel I have it anyway because I need to have insurance, but I don't think that the ones made for digital nomads are still as good as they should be. I think they could be better. The one as a as someone who travels a lot, I would probably go for world nomads, although it's very pricey, very, very pricey. If you're in the US, um, Alliance, um is usually the go-to one of course i make sure that it covers first of all age age is super important does it cover you depending on what age you are do you have any underlying medical conditions i you also have to be really really transparent about that so obviously it depends on your personal case i um, don't have anything and i'm not over 60 so i'm pretty flexible with my insurance but yeah as a but Alliance, for example, is only valid up to three months. You have to be back in the U.S. after 90 days for it to be for it to still be valid. So if you're traveling in and out of the country, I would probably recommend Alliance, if not World Nomads. But like I said, it's really pricey. And and can I can I ask you, do you feel like uh, there's something miss? Like maybe what's the one thing that you if you I'm curious because I'm going to have some people who, who who handle travel insurance. Listen to this. If there was one thing on travel insurance that you think they should do. Is there one thing that may be missing coverage that you think uh, should be available? Honestly, the main one is just basically filing, like actually find, filing claims successfully because a lot of them pretend that they're going to cover you. And then once something happens, they're like, oh, yeah, sorry, we're not giving you your money back. And so that's as a traveler, that is extremely, extremely frustrating. Any thoughts on Safety Wing? So Safety Wing, uh, I'm seeing the comments here right now. Yep. Safety Wing has done an amazing job at marketing. They're so good. And they like as a content creator, uh, they've reached to me once or twice. I know a lot of people that actually use their affiliate marketing program and they're constantly um, promoting it. I would not use Safety Wing. Their reviews are horrible. And I'm, this is where, like, I as a content creator, like, I still want to have values and I don't want to just be promoting something just because I'm getting paid for it. I would not promote Safety Wings. What 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 do you think, by the way, Cebu, what do you think makes a good insurance versus not good insurance? Maybe so that people understand what they're looking for. What should they be looking for? And what are important to you as you're out there? You're like, I need to have this type of coverage. What's important? And I, I know you mentioned make ease of use of filing a claim. I'll get that. That's number one. What, what's number two? What's the other thing? I would divide it into two different parts. The travel part of the insurance and the medical part of the insurance. Medical part of the insurance. How much are you going to get covered for? Does it cover dental? Because you might think, oh, I don't need dental. Like, what if I fall on my face and I break half of my mm -hmm. teeth? You know, like, I want to make sure that can get fixed. Uh, again, underlying medical conditions. That's super important as well. Um 
repatriation like if i pass away am i is my body gonna get shipped somewhere or are they just gonna let it rot wherever it is that i am you know i know this sounds really really morbid but these are like you know we're not gonna live forever and these are things that we do need to think about so i make sure that i'm covered to a certain amount and this is super important if ideally you can get your travel insurance let's say i break a leg um and it's five thousand dollars my travel insurance will cover as much of it as possible so instead of me paying up front and then them giving me the money back because this is where it gets really tricky and then you don't get the money back make sure that they'll actually and there are very very few insurance companies that do this uh that you potentially can get at least a chunk of it paid up front by the insurance company and then you can cover the rest and once all the fl- claims have gone through then you uh recover the rest of the money so that's the medical part and then the travel part um trip cancellation trip delay um lost luggage um stolen uh, make uh, very few offer when it comes to stolen stuff um electronics do they cover electronics because a lot of them are like yeah no maybe no like i want to know that my phone and my computer and my camera are actually covered and i'll get money back for them because a lot of them don't I, so i would basically just divide it into those two different categories they are two different categories thank you sibu we were talking about those things yesterday in our in our mentorship. So thank you for reconfirming. Uh, there was a question from Gene. She wants to know about the stons. Do you think they're safe? Are they worth going to all yeah. the? Things? Yes, definitely. I've been to two. So I've been to Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'm actually next week. Um, I'm launching our trip to Pakistan. I've been to Pakistan a few times, and my co-founder is Pakistani. So you will not be going to Pakistan with anybody better than us. And the other five stands, there's seven. Um, I'm actually going there next summer. I was going to go this summer, but I had to go to Europe instead. And I'm going to be traveling everything by land and train. So, yes, super safe, um, even as a solo female traveler. The only one that's a bit trickier is Turkmenistan because you have to go with a guide. You're not allowed. Like I said before, Turkmenistan is like the North Korea of Central Asia. So you have to go with a guide. You're not allowed to travel on your own. Everything else you can 100 percent do on your own. And, and do you use like Apple? Do you can you use Waze? Like what 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 guide when you're driving? What the what app do you use for that? Um, that's a very interesting question. You will have to do um, research on the ground to see what works best. So, for example, like I said, I'm originally Costa Rican. Um, Google Maps is terrible in Costa Rica. I do not understand why. So Waze is the go-to app. How would you know this? I look it up online. So you will have to. I for the most part, I use Google Maps. But I know that it's not 100% reliable um, in most places. Another thing that's really important, um, car sharing apps Mm -hmm. like Uber. Um, Uber is widely available in a lot of places. But for example, when you're going to uh, former Soviet Union Union countries, you might have to download their version of Uber, which is completely safe and something that I do every every, anywhere I go. If I download one of these car sharing apps, I make sure that my card information is already on the app so i don't have to handle cash and that means less risk because i don't want to get ripped off or i don't want the driver to think that i owe him more money it's all on the app and there is no money exchange whatsoever going on so when you're at all these different countries do you go with some global eSIM or do you have a particular program or do you get a local eSIM how does it normally work to get that gps signal when you're I do a little bit of everything, actually. So I just got a SIM card this morning. Um, the last Europe, I was doing eSIMs. Um, but if you're traveling, I don't see the point of doing roaming. I think that most companies charge 10 per day. I think Verizon has a really good plan where they only charge 65 per day. And that works basically everywhere around the world. If you don't have, if you have an Android, um, I would highly recommend you look into Google. Um, oh, God, what's it called? Google Fi. Hey, Google Fi. Google Fi. So if, if you're an Android user, I would highly recommend you go look into Google Fi. The problem with Google, I cannot use, I would love to use Google, but I can't because it, after three months outside of the U.S., it no longer works. Uh, 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 Catherine wants to know, have you ever been to North Korea? Um, I have not. It's on the list. I know this sounds crazy. I will go. However, just making it very clear to all of you watching this, if you only have a U.S. passport, you're not allowed to go to North Korea. And this is not because the North Korean government said so, but actually Trump put up a policy back in 2016 or 17, which makes it pretty much considered treason for you to go to North Korea. And if you do, you will get your passport revoked. 
because you're going against um, the U.S. government, basically. It's treason. So if you're watching this, if you only have a U.S. passport, do not go to North Korea. If you have another passport, another nationality, I do, I'll be using my, my other passport. Um, again, it's extremely risky. And imagine like having someone revoke your passport. Um, Trump... I think this law just got renewed, by the way, this policy. So I think you're going to, but before 2017, and like any U.S. citizen could go. So I would just recommend waiting it out. There are 196 other countries you can visit. So just don't go to North Korea. Go somewhere else. Yeah, I, I have friends that like to go to the DMZ line and <laughs> like to I go. I went to the DMZ and I mean, it's fascinating. You can go to South Korea, you can go to the DMZ, take a little tour, and you can actually lay eyes on South Korea, which is fascinating and you can even take the tours of the buildings and for some people um, including Guinness records if you go to if you take one specific tour where there's a building that's shared by both borders that officially means you've been to North Korea but I don't think that means you've been to North Korea yeah that's like saying I've done a long layover in an airport and I've been to that country I feel that's it's the same thing you have to really go to North Korea to say you've been to North Korea but the DMZ is definitely interesting. Sibu you mentioned that you know, during this time of all the travel, you found that there wasn't always a, a tour that you would like to put. So you put your own tour company together. Tell us a little bit about that. What makes maybe your tour agency a little different than maybe what most people find on, you know, out there? I feel like nowadays it has never been this accessible to travel, which is great, right? Like everything's just a, a click away on our phones, but that also means that we have basically shut ourselves down, put ourselves in a bubble and we don't interact with locals anymore. We just don't. And if we do, maybe it'll be the guide of the tour that we hired, but that's basically it. We don't have proper interactions with locals. And so, I've actually been on tours through my university. Um, this was years and years ago when I was doing my master's degree where we would actually meet with locals and I was in shock. And so one of these tours that I took was actually with my co-founder. She organized it years ago um, and I was blown away. I was like, I have never done such immersive travel in my life. So basically what we were doing, we were meeting with people, um, refugees and display people who have lived experience of displacement. Um, and we were sitting down with them through through the nonprofit that my colleague has. Um, and we were basically sitting with them and learning about history, not just from like books or tour guides, but from people that had actually lived through history. And that to me was priceless. Like as a self-declared geek, um, I, I love learning. And so, and it wasn't just, you know, hearing facts. This was built in 18 something. No, like these were actual stories. And when we travel, we don't memorize facts. We remember stories. So all of a sudden I was traveling and listening to people's stories and learning about everything that was happening on the ground through these people's stories and they were being kept alive. And so this was the first one I took with her was in 2019 and I was blown away. And so I reached out to her and I was like, look, I've got experience in the travel industry. Um, business development would you want to partner up and because she has a lot of different projects she has a podcast she's creating um so the name of the organization is our world too and they basically focus on changing the narratives of refugees and i reached out and i was like hey would you be interested in partnering up and then of course we know what happened the pandemic hit so we basically had to wait until 2022 um, so we got together. So it's a permanent partnership that I have with a nonprofit and we organize these tours together. So what we do, yes, we have fun. We go to like, we go sightseeing. We do like we hit all the main spots, but we also work with locals to curate unique itineraries. And I know for a fact that nobody on the ground is offering the itineraries that we're offering because we're going beyond. We're, we, yes, we're I'm in Jordan. And the reason I'm in Jordan is because we have a tour coming up at the end of the month. And yeah, we'll go to Petra Wadi Room, we'll float in the Dead Sea. We're going to do all that stuff, but we're also going off the beaten path. And on top of that, we're going to be one of the days we're going to be doing like a cultural workshop with Iraqi women who used to be refugees. Uh, we're meeting with locals, with nonprofits. So it's basically a combination of fun and education. So it's a more immersive experience into a country, but it's not just being bombarded by facts. It's just learning from people on the ground and having fun while doing so. Sibu, are you going to be leading that, that group tour in Jordan? Uh, well, I don't lead it. So that's the thing. I would never want to take away 
positions of people working on the ground. I do not claim to be a Jordan expert, even though I've been I've been here many times. So what we do is we partner with locals. So we have a local guide on the ground um, and they're going to be the ones doing everything, of course, but I am going to be attending this tour. Okay, so you'll be there. How many days is that one that's coming up? Um, this one is eight days. So normally we offer one week trips um, and starts on a weekend, finishes on the weekend. As someone who's worked in an office, I understand like the struggle of taking time off. So we want to make sure that people can fly in on the weekend, leave on the weekend and be back at, be back at work on, on Monday. Can you still have any spots left for that Jordan trip if somebody wants to join and is watching right now? I do. We actually had two people drop out last minute. So if anybody is crazy and spontaneous enough to join a last minute tour to Jordan, hit me up. Um, and I can even help you look for flights and tell you which points and routes to use and everything. Like I said, it's going to be the experience of a lifetime and I'm super excited. What's most important is that tourism is at an all time low at the moment because of the situation happening in the neighboring country. And, um, I know this sounds crazy, but this is a pretty good time to visit because prices are pretty low. I've seen flights from both East and West Coast for less than a thousand round trip um, with like uh, Qatar and I think Turkish Airlines. And um, and yeah, and a lot of companies are shutting down and a lot of people have, lo have lost their jobs. And when you talk to locals on the ground, they'll tell you that, you know, there's stuff happening in the neighboring country, but that doesn't mean that it's not safe to be here. Uh, See, so we can um, just about this trip for a second. So you're saying Jordan is safe to, to visit? Yes. Okay. And then my second part is, do you, can you do you handle just the land part or does it have to be the land and the hotel? Is that all combined already? Or we, you So you pay for your own flights because, so basically we encourage, so our company is not US focused. So we have people from around the world join us, um, which is really cool. So you'll get to meet travelers from all around the world and bond with them. Uh, but yeah, you cover your airfare and then the moment you land, you give us your flight info and there'll be someone there picking you up and arranging everything. So you don't have to, you can just relax the whole week. Uh, we take care of everything for you. Cebu, do you think you can offer my viewers who are watching this, like for this Jordan shirt, I think you said you have a couple. Could you offer a, a, a slight discount? Is that something available to our viewers here? Yeah, I, I think I can. I think I can. Okay. Okay. For well, folks, reach out to Cebu. Uh, where can they find you, by the way? Um, so you can find me on Go Global with Cebu, S-I-B-U. I'm sure you can see it written here. And I'm based on uh, the website, working on my YouTube. But I have a lot of different travel resources um, helping you feel more confident while traveling, whether that's alone or with someone, but also to like different destinations that we find a little bit more um, daunting. And I'm, I'm here to show you that if I've been able to do it for almost 20 years, so can you. The only thing stopping you is your head. I, I wanted to wrap up with this, Cebu. I think there's a lot of folks out there that are looking at maybe even moving overseas. Catherine asked about some of these golden visas. What are your thoughts on some of those things? Um, I would highly, highly encourage it. And I actually have a whole section on my website on how Americans can move abroad or live abroad. And I'm not saying this should be a long-term thing, but I do think it's something that everybody should experience once in their lifetime. So if you want to go and give it a chance for a year or two, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and there's plenty, plenty of ways to do so. You can also book a consultation with me and I can guide you through the different uh, processes, different countries that you can move to, whether it's as, as a digital nomad, as a student or someone simply that or getting a job on the ground, because a lot of, for example, European countries and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, for example, are desperate for workers. So it's a lot easier to move abroad than we think it is. Um, and I would, like I said, I would highly, highly encourage people to do that and just give it a try, like once in a lifetime. And if you're not comfortable or you think it's a short term thing, then you can easily pack your bags and go back home. But this is coming from someone that has lived abroad more than half of their life. Um, I would highly recommend it. Another thing is that um, if you're interested, I also I've. I've done so many things over the years, like I've lived abroad, I've studied abroad, I've won scholarships, like I, I feel like I've done everything right over the last 20, almost 20 years. Um, and now I've become pretty good at like picking out these different things. So there's a thing called free travel opportunities. So there's if you potentially wanted to do a bachelor's or master's or PhD abroad, it will be 100 percent funded. Um, 
And these are opportunities that I share on my website and on my newsletter. And I'm developing more as we speak right now. So it should be like, so if you sign up for my newsletter, I give out free travel. I send out free travel opportunities. So giveaways, different trips. So I've been to about a hundred countries um, and more than 10 of those have been hundred percent for free because I've won these travel opportunities. So it's not all a scam. It's not, um, because sometimes we think there's no way that's real. I'm going to get trafficked and somebody's going to take my organs. No, like it's actually real. And I've become really good at finding these. So I share all of these on my newsletter and I'm going to start sharing them on my website as well, really, really soon. So I'm basically building a database on my website because I come across so many nowadays and I want to make sure that people take advantage of those. So the world is yours. That's what I like to believe. And it's up to you whether or not you want to take advantage of it for a week, two weeks, a year, six months. It's entirely up to you. But I do highly recommend that you go out there, whoever's watching this, and travel because the world is much safer than we give it credit for. See, can you give us a few countries off the beaten path that you think Americans, if they wanted to retire, we hear this all the time, like, if I want to retire and I'm, you know, someplace off being and maybe affordable, what are some of your favorite countries to, to maybe top three? Off the beaten path. So that's an interesting one because I have no idea what the situation would be like in 30 years. So I don't know if I can recommend off the beaten path, but I know like Southeast Asia, well, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam are really popular choices. C Costa Rica, of course. Mexico. I love Nicaragua. It's my favorite country in Central America, but not a lot of people go there. Um, in Europe, obviously, Portugal, Italy. I would go for Italy over Spain. Um, what else? Bosnia. Bosnia is pretty great. Bulgaria, Romania. Like There are plenty of options. And when it comes to the African continent, when it comes to retirement, I'm not too aware of that specific region. I can tell you how to get there as a digital nomad or as a, um, as some, yeah, as a digital nomad. But for retirement, I don't have that much information about it. Right, that's great. See, but how large how large is your group trips? How many people usually attend this when you're when you're planning out? We keep them small. So the last thing I want is to be. I don't think that's nice at all. Like I, I, be, I think people hear tours and they have this horrible idea that they'll be in a bus with 30, 50 other people and it's all going to be pure chaos. Like that's not what I want to do. No, thank you. Like I, I want to create small groups in which everybody gets to know and interact with each other. And hopefully they leave with, you know, lifelong friendships because this is what happens you know like you meet someone like one of our participants now who, she just signed up a few days ago she's from kenya so now you're gonna have a kenyan friend you know um and you could potentially go to kenya one day and visit her like they this is what i want to try and encourage you know like lifelong friendships with people from around the world so we try to keep it small 10 to 15 max and are they couples are they solo are they you know younger demographic are they older demographic um I, so there's a little bit of everything. The youngest person we've had participate is 19 and not, I don't want to say the oldest one, but you know, the most mature one was 62, 63. So obviously there's different levels of intensity and walking involved every day. So we will let you know uh, what is involved. But for example, with Jordan right now, it's, you know, there's a lot of traveling by car. And when we go to Petra, which is probably going to be the most intense part of our trip, Petra is basically divided into two. You can stay in the flat part, uh, which is super doable. And if you have a little bit more energy, then you can go up the stairs all the way to the monastery on the other side and basically die uh, because it's it, not intense, but you know, you, you will sweat uh, for sure. And it will be quite a workout. So it all depends. And we do try to keep this um, in mind, but I would say probably the average age of people traveling with us is 30s. All right. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much, Cebu, for uh, your time. Once again, uh, if they want to get on your website, is it Go Global with Cebu? Is that the website? Yes, it's, it's written here. Go Global with Cebu.com. All right, everyone, go check it out. Go join her, uh, Jordan. And what's after Jordan? After Jordan, what else do you have coming up uh, for next tours? Um, so we've got Bosnia um, in October. And then next year, uh, we're actually launching, like I said, we're launching Pakistan really, really soon next week actually and that's going to be amazing so that's a little bit longer because pakistan is huge and it has tons to offer so that's going to be around 13 days 
Um, so basically, we have these three destinations. We do offer shorter trips. These would be custom trips, of course. Um, so if anybody's interested, you can reach out and we can definitely organize something for you. The, the reason why we do the tours is because we want to encourage people from around the world to get together and travel together. But if you wanted to go solo with your partner and do a custom itinerary, that's something that we can definitely, definitely offer. So we have these three destinations right now. By the end of next, by summer next year, we're also working on launching Armenia and Georgia as a package together. And well, that should keep us fairly busy. So we, it's not like I'm just launching trips around the world. We do, we go to these destinations. We know these destinations really well. Like I'm here in Jordan three weeks in advance, right? To make sure everything's running smoothly. Like this is no joke. It's not like I'm just gonna pop in a day or two before. Like we're really, really engaged and passionate about the work that we're doing and how we're supporting local communities through travel, which I think is really cool. Um, but also we are, we work with custom itineraries and so that means that a lot of time goes into this so i could easily launch trips to i don't know maybe five ten more destinations but we want to make sure that we do it in a sustainable manner and that um yeah we're expanding at a reasonable rate but i think that should be a pretty good combination of different destinations so europe middle east south asia um caucasus so yeah but we're excited to see what what comes up next well, thank you, Cebu. I'm looking forward uh, to hearing more and more about it. I know my folks are interested in hearing about your next trips as well. Thank you again, Cebu, for, for joining us today. And thank you. We'll have a, have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody. Um, and if you're interested in joining one of our trips, reach out. I'll make sure that you make sure to let me know that you attended this workshop. And I promise to give you a discount.